Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to News Dose. So, we need to get another update today for the Xbox Activision Blizzard acquisition as more regulators are coming in to take a closer look to see whether or not this deal could actually harm competition or consumers. This is reportedly one of the first probes by a major antitrust enforcer, so we're going to dive into that a little later on today and see exactly what all this means for the future of this buyout. Also, the gamers holiday for 2022 might be over with all of those showcases in June being behind us now. But looks like we do have a lot more to look forward to in 2023 as E3 seems to be set to return with a physical event. So we'll talk about that one as well. Before we get into all that, though, we do have plenty of other things to talk about. So let's just go and jump right into things, starting off with Psychonauts 2. Now, Psychonauts 2 released last year to just absolutely glowing praise. It was actually one of the highest rated games in 2022, well deserved by the way, and won multiple, multiple awards. Honestly, I personally believe that should have won a lot more than what it did, but nonetheless, this is an absolutely spectacular game to put a short, and it's actually one of my favorite games to release here in recent years. Though, there was one problem with its release, and that really just comes down to the simple fact that it only released digitally. This was a big letdown for a lot of fans out there, myself included, as I am a huge fan of this game. But I do have some good news today, as that's now officially set to change. Double Fine and I Am 8-Bit just announced a physical release that you can either buy on the I Am 8-Bit website or through partner retailers. Now, if you buy it directly through them, you only have one option, which is $130 Collector's Edition, which might seem a little steep here, but it does include not only Psychonauts 2, but also the first game as well on a completely separate disc in what appears to be its own case. Now, I don't know exactly why they're not showing that case in box art just yet, but it does appear that it will have its own case. So that is a very, very nice touch. And actually, for the Xbox One version, this is the first ever backwards compatible game to release on an Xbox One disc. So you're kind of witnessing history here in a way, but if you do prefer to just get the first game, the standard edition will be available through partner retailers for $70. Though, as of this recording, they're currently not up just yet. I am 8 bit did assure that they should appear within the next 24 hours, though. So, for you physical collectors out there, you might want to pick up Psychonauts 2 and possibly even Psychonauts 1. And if you haven't played these games already, please do yourself a favor and change it. These are excellent, excellent, excellent games. Next up, we got an update for Gamescom as Xbox has now confirmed that they will indeed be there this year from August 24th through the 28th. This was already heavily rumored as we've discussed before, but now it's official and they went ahead and keyed us in on what to expect. If you take a look here, you can see their statement where they said, We're excited to confirm that Xbox will be back on the show floor at Gamescom 2022 in Cologne, Germany. Fans in Europe and around the world can expect updates on some announced games coming to Xbox in the next 12 months. So there it is. It is official now. But what this kind of tells you is that they're not necessarily looking to announce brand new games here. It seems like this is more of a follow up of what they did at the Xbox Bethesda showcase, where they just showed games that are set to release within the next 12 months. Now, does that mean from August 2022 to August 2023? If that's the case, they could give us some new updates that are slightly beyond just June as they showed back at the Xbox Bethesda Showcase. But even then, I would kind of go in with tempered expectations. I would not go into this expecting much different than what we saw last month. But however, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are some games that were at that Xbox Bethesda Showcase that could use further gameplay updates. You know, another Starfield gameplay trailer, that would be pretty cool as an example. Arc 2, that's another one. We haven't exactly seen much in the way of gameplay for that one just yet. And maybe even Aura History Untold. So even though they aren't necessarily looking to announce brand new games per se, there could still be some worthwhile reveals here at Gamescom 2022. Also, Ubisoft just re-revealed Skull and Bones with a lengthy gameplay trailer and even a release date for November 8th of 2022. And that right there immediately got me off guard. And the reason I say that is because this is a game that has been delayed various, various times since it was first announced back in 2017. 
And then when it's finally ready to go, it gets its big gameplay reveal and everything, and Ubisoft decides that the best time to release this game is on November 8th, just one day before one of the biggest releases of the entire year is set to come out, being God of War Ragnarok. Yeah, I, I do have some questions for Ubisoft here. I mean, just yesterday, Square Enix, they decided to delay Forspoken into January of 2023 for quote-unquote strategic reasons. Well, those strategic reasons are more than likely that it's a less busy time of the year and that those holiday months are increasingly getting more crowded with just absolute behemoths such as God of War and Call of Duty. So a new IP like this could easily get buried among a very busy part of the year like this. But, I mean, I, I guess Ubisoft, they must really believe in Skull and Bones here as they're releasing it directly next to Ragnarok. I guess we'll see how all that works out for them, but nonetheless, we did get more than seven minutes of new gameplay for Skull and Bones where they took a deep dive into how exactly the gameplay works. Now, this seems to be a pretty decent sized game and Skull and Bones does have a lot of customization. It can be played completely solo or with friends, which is really nice to see. And you can even get out of your ship and explore as a pirate, though maybe not as much as what I would have actually preferred. Nonetheless, though, it does seem like they're trying to do quite a bit here with Skull and Bones, so I would definitely recommend checking out the complete trailer if you want to see more on Skull and Bones. Let's go and talk about that Xbox Activision Blizzard acquisition, though, as we did get yet another update. So what's happening here is that the UK's Competition and Market Authority, aka the CMA, is now officially getting involved by putting out a probe to investigate whether this acquisition could pose any type of antitrust problems. In their official statement, they noted that this could include quote-unquote higher prices, lower quality, or even reduced choices as an example. We'll kind of get back to that here in just a moment, but they're also asking third parties for feedback if they do have any type of concern about the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition, with a consultation running until July 20th. Though I wouldn't necessarily expect much pushback from any type of third party. The entire investigation, though, is set to end on September 1st, so we'll hear more about their findings sometime in September. The big question here, though, is this actually bad? for Microsoft, and I think the answer to that is no, it's really not. Instead, this is actually to be expected. This is more or less just standard procedure, and in fact, Microsoft's corporate vice president responded by saying that regulatory scrutiny of the deal was to be expected and that they will fully cooperate. They then continued on to say this, we're committed to answering questions from regulators and ultimately believe a thorough review will help the deal close with broad confidence and that it will be positive for competition. We remain confident that the deal will close in fiscal year 2023 as initially anticipated. So as you can see here, Microsoft, they, they really don't seem bothered by this investigation at all. And actually, it seems like they expected it. And I think that that's kind of the thing here. One thing that everybody needs to kind of understand is that this type of stuff will continue to pop up. On a monthly basis, we are hearing about this acquisition because, well, it is huge and it is a long process. So we're all just kind of learning through this entire process together. This is an unprecedented thing as we've never seen something like this before. I mean, we are talking about a nearly $70 billion buyout, which, I mean, that isn't just the biggest acquisition in game history, but it's also the biggest buyout in Microsoft's history. So this certainly will catch a lot of attention from regulators across any region that Xbox and Microsoft operates in. And that's what we're seeing here. The CMA over in the UK want to do their due diligence here. Though the questions that they're asking, I think that that should actually have Microsoft relatively confident. Again, if you look at the examples that the CMA uses, I think it bodes well for Microsoft. One thing that they want to do is they want to make sure that this doesn't lead to higher prices for consumers, which so far, Microsoft has been one of the most affordable publishers releasing their games at $60. Then you have the Xbox Series S, which is the most affordable next generation platform. And plus, Xbox Game Pass continues to be an absolutely fantastic deal for gamers. So I would say that that's probably a big check for Xbox. They also want to know about quality. They want to make sure that this doesn't lead to lower quality with their future releases, which I would say that that's kind of hard to prove. But if you look at past history, since Microsoft has acquired other studios, well, Xbox has improved. Xbox did, in fact, win the best publisher just last year, according to Metacritic. 
So I would say that that's probably a good sign as well. And then also another thing that the CMA wants to take a look into is reduced choice for consumers. Now, with this acquisition, Xbox could technically make future releases exclusive to the Xbox ecosystem, but I think Xbox has been well ahead of this one as well. Not only does their ecosystem include the majority of devices across the world, including Xbox, they have PC, mobile, and they also have game streaming through the cloud. But also, on top of that, they've already made concessions that popular franchises such as Call of Duty will remain multi-platform even after the acquisition is completed complete. So again, if you take a look at all of those things, I don't necessarily foresee any problems there either. But even then, this is still the second ongoing investigation, and we'll closely monitor this as we hear more. At least we do have a deadline here though, which is for September 1st, so as soon as we do hear more, I will let you all know as soon as possible. But for the time being, if I were to guess, I would just say that this is probably business per usual. Moving on though, the ESA also made a big announcement today as they confirmed E3 will be returning in 2023 with a physical in-person event. And they even have a new partner this time being ReadPop. Now this is actually pretty good news here and if you don't know ReadPop, they're actually a global leader in pop culture events. You might know them for putting together events like PAX East and the New York Comic Con as an example. So they do know how to organize these big showcases and that's what they're looking to do with E3 in 2023. Here they are being put in charge with the responsibility of bringing back E3 in 2023. And I think that that's a great sign. You know, the last few years, E3 has been sorely missing. And I think that a lot of gamers have definitely felt that. Now we've had the Summer Game Fest and everything and I think that it was much improved this year, but even then, there's still a lot of people out there that miss E3 and those crowds with their live reactions. Those reactions, they, they really do add a little something to these showcases and that can't just simply be replaced with these digital only events. Even then though, that's still the main question here. The ESA and ReadPop are now committed to bringing E3 back, but will publishers be as committed? I think that that is the biggest hurdle here. Over the last few years, we've seen publishers have a lot of success with their digital only events. And it's actually far cheaper this way. In fact, you have Nintendo, which has been doing their own directs for years and years. And then PlayStation, well, they abandoned E3 before the Summer Game Fest was a thing. And they now just do their own thing with PlayStation State of Play. So there is that question on whether or not publishers actually need E3. It has to be a mutual relationship between the two. And because of that, I think that the ESA and ReadPop, I think that they do have a major challenge ahead of them just simply trying to convince publishers to participate. Now, actually about that, per usual, anytime there's an E3 announcement, Jeff Keighley, he likes to chime in as he did today. This was already kind of known, but he did reconfirm that the Summer Game Fest will also return in 2023. Might be a little bit of a petty tweet and everything, but there you have more confirmation that the Summer Game Fest will be coming back next year. Let me know what you all think about this, though. Do you think E3 should return as an in-person event next year, or do you think publishers should stick with their digital-only format? Let me know in the comments below. Let's go and take a look at the poll of the day though, where I asked you all, do you think Xbox should start doing multiple smaller events throughout the year instead of relying on just one big showcase? And as you can see here, the majority of you all do believe that they should do this with 69% of you saying yes, while 25% of you said no. And I am in complete agreement with you all here. I do think that Xbox should start to put out more showcases. While I do absolutely love these big, huge showcases like E3, the Summer Game Fest, or whatever, these are amazing showcases and they're very, very exciting. And they can still have that one big event throughout the year, but I also feel like that they need to give fans more frequent updates as well. I mean, I've heard them say things like they have so many games in development now that they don't even know where to announce them all. Well, they could do that by having their own little event every single quarter. And I think that it would also lessen some of the pressure of just having that one super successful event every single year. With smaller showcases, that could give them a lot of flexibility. They could talk about third party games. They could talk about their upcoming first party games. They could talk about Xbox Game Pass and some different partnerships that they have in development. They, they could do a lot of different things with these smaller showcases. And I think that that would just kind of 
I think it would give fans something consistently to look forward to rather than just kind of having this mysterious unknown gap for a long period of time. So I, I do think that they should maybe start to think about putting together some of these smaller showcases. And, and I know that they had inside Xbox in the past, but that wasn't done very well. I think that what they should do is just really just flat out copy what Nintendo and PlayStation are doing with their directs. Just kind of do that. Anyways, though, that's it for this episode, but if you liked the video, don't forget to bell notification and subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, if you'd like to support the channel through Patreon, thank you for making this content possible. Peace out.